Hello, everybody. I would like to welcome you to a special discussion between three interesting panelists. So we have Vincent Cerf, the ACM Turing Award uh, winner of 2004. We have Alessio Figali, the Fields Medalist, one of the Fields Medalists of 2018, and Efim Zelmanov, who won the Fields Medal in 1994. And the three of us will discuss among themselves and with us the scientific exchange and collaboration in the post-COVID era. So perhaps, Wenden, perhaps you could start and yeah. just say a bit about how you experience the change of how scientific collaboration works. Well, certainly, like everyone else, uh, I haven't been traveling and I haven't been meeting anyone face to face. I've been uh, here in my basement office for the last six months, sitting in this chair, doing a lot of video conferencing. And so the first thing I would observe is that post-COVID is an interesting term because uh, I don't believe we will eradicate this particular uh, disease. It will be around uh, like other coronaviruses. And so we will probably have to have periodic vaccine shots, uh, which of course aren't yet even available. Uh, although perhaps, uh, I guess there have been at least one announcement of a, of a vaccine uh, from Russia. So we're at the beginning of a process for, um, for trying to um, get better control over the uh, spread of this virus. I think also, uh, like many other people, I've spent most of my time in the last six months online, either using the internet for exchange of information or exchange of data or having video conferences or doing email uh, or just surfing the web uh, looking for uh, content of use. And I believe even in the post-COVID period, two things are going to happen. The first one is that people will have discovered they can work from home in many cases, whereas before they might not have been able to do that or, or their employers thought they couldn't. And I think that will be a permanent shift. People will be flexibly able to work uh, at, at home as well as in their offices. And the second thing is that the uh, access to an exchange of information will continue to be extremely important uh, in order to advance scientific progress. And so as has been true in the past, sharing of information, getting access to uh, current results is very important and the internet has a role to play in that. So I'm curious to see what my two colleagues have to say about this same question. So Alessio, you want to? Okay, then I will start. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we're all in the same situation. Likely here in Switzerland, uh, we are at least a bit back to normal, if we can say normal, we're back to the office at least a few days a week. Uh, so interactions are restarting a bit and also with, you know, teaching, we do a bit of in-present teaching, with, even if few students can come and many are away. So uh, I, of course, we've done a lot of collaboration online. Um, personally, uh, I understand we need to find solutions. It's not ideal for me. Maybe everyone has his own way of doing mathematics, but uh, I like a lot, uh, you know, to interact in front of a blackboard and uh, spend time with collaborators and chatting over uh, sometimes nonsense because, you know, when you don't have a clear idea yet of how to prove a mathematical theorem, sometimes you're just there trying, trying and, uh, I don't know. I I don't like. The, it's difficult to do the same to reproduce the same with a computer. I mean, being both in front of a screen with a collaborator doesn't work the same. So, I think we're fi trying to find solutions. Uh, we need, of course, to uh, find a compromise. Uh, you know, very careful with masks and everything. But uh, I mean, the, the problem is is going to be traveling, right? So traveling will not be easy, actually, and. Um, these affects on, I think, mostly the research part. It affects less, I think, the exchange of uh, um, of res information research. I mean, we're organizing a lot of online seminars, which is good. Uh, it's, so it's very easy to, still to disseminate works uh, and, uh, you know, share ideas and particularly, you know, discuss new developments. Still, uh, as, you know, many of us know that when we go to a conference, it's not just uh, listening to a talk, it's also to have the chance to talk to the speaker and, you know, ask the details that is difficult to ask just in, when uh, you listen to the conference 
ones or something, right? So it's really the atmosphere with that we are missing. And uh, we will have to find compromises. Um, this summer I organized a hybrid conference in Oberwolfach, so 20 participants in presence and uh, 25 online. And, uh, you know, we do what we can, um, but yeah, things will, I agree with Vim telling out that, um, uh, you know, this, this virus will not go away like that. I mean, we'll have to first find a good vaccine and then have enough vaccinations for everyone. And then probably this will mutate and we have to get vaccinations over. We don't know the strength of the virus, how it will change over time. I mean, there are too many questions, but okay, as mathematicians or computer scientists or researchers in general, we need to go on and find solutions. We are lucky that technology is on our side, I think. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. Maybe like, we can move to the next. Within. Well, I'm an optimist. I think that this Zoom conferences and Zoom seminars will, of course, enrich scientific exchanges and uh, they will stay even when things more or less get back to normal. But I think that uh, real conferences when people meet each other uh, are still needed and there will be some conferences. We will travel, maybe we'll travel less at the beginning because it will take time to persuade funding agencies that such conferences are needed. But eventually we will get back to normal. So I'm an optimist. So I think that you make a very good point, Dafim, that uh, people getting together uh, is very different face-to-face, -face, sharing a meal, having a break, taking a walk, standing in front of a whiteboard, having a massive argument about some particular equation um, is, is my favorite mode of operation is in front of the whiteboard, drawing pictures or, you know, writing equations and, and having a big debate uh, because out of that intensity, I think often comes some real insight. So I'm frankly looking forward to the time when we can get back together again. But on the other side of this, as a technologist, I'm very interested in the possibility of uh, creating devices that simulate this kind of interaction. For example, I, I agree that typing on a keyboard is not the same as writing on, on a whiteboard, but I wonder if we could have a kind of a shared whiteboard where anything you write is visible to me and anything I write is visible to you. Um, I've seen attempts at doing this and they've mostly been crappy. Uh, that's a technical term. Um, but, uh, but I think it might be possible uh, to achieve that objective, but it still is not the same, I think, as feeling like you're right there with someone else having this debate. So I have to ask you whether, whether this in-person debate thing, and from your experience, uh, has made a big difference in terms of you know, discovery and solution of problems. I want to stress the importance of human warmth in education. Uh, the warmth between a teacher and the student, uh, between two students, that's a way of inspiration. That's where we, we find inspiration. And human warmth on the screen of a computer is, <laughs> is a problem. So Alessio, for, for your work, what's, what's your conclusion about uh, the importance of the face-to-face -face things? And of course, this wonderful presence, this inspirational presence that, that Efim is talking about, it, certainly I resonate with that. How about you? I completely agree. I mean, it's so important. And I think we also, I, I see it myself when I watch two talks and also that uh, it's not the same the fact that you are online. First of all, it's more difficult to concentrate usually. And second, um, you know, I remember myself when I was a student, maybe the professor writes something and then you don't understand what's written on the blackboard, you talk to the guy next to you or whoever, and you start to say, oh, but what do you say? But I don't understand what he's doing. It's too complicated, whatever. I mean, you need, you know, bonding and <laughs> from the people around you and doing this at home, it's tricky, right? So I, of course, I mean, we're lucky there is technology, otherwise probably we'll, we wouldn't even be able to teach, but still um, it's very important. And also one point that has been 
discussed, I mean, also the funding, you know, uh, I'm the director of an institute in Zurich and uh, I was in a big meeting some months ago with all the institutes of research of Europe, the, the big, most of them. And uh, we are all in the situation where we got public funding to organize conferences and now we're almost unable to do that. Uh, and, but then still you need to do something because if the funding are cut, then uh, it's difficult to get the money back uh, at some moment. So uh, that's why I was I was very positively impressed by Oberwolfach in Germany, the way they are operating, they've been extremely efficient. So actually I'm trying to emulate them here in Zurich, but still, yeah, so there are a lot of if around and um, but uh, yeah, we need to <laughs> be strong and we need also to find the uh, compromises. So I think we need to probably to, to work more local like we do with food, you know, zero kilometer food for environment. Probably we need <laughs> to say, okay, uh, you know, Europe is still a big continent and then we can work more at the European scale or especially at some scale and then US more on their scale. And then, you know, for intercontinental, we'll have to wait a moment, but uh, I mean, we cannot completely avoid uh, interactions. Uh, but, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty in it now, so I understand that people are also a bit scared. So it, it's been again, and I, I want to uh, shift the conversation a little bit uh, back to technology for a moment. A lot of schools, whether it's colleges or high schools or even elementary schools, have been forced into an online uh, engagement in order to keep people safe. And I think the tools for teaching online are still fairly uh, crude. And it raises some interesting questions from, from my point of view. How does education change when we're forced into this online mode? And I will argue that one thing which is quite helpful is that if you record a lecture, then you can play it over and over again. It's, it's hard to ask the professor to keep repeating himself or herself. But if you have it recorded, which is what many of the teachers now do, then the students have the opportunity to replay the lecture. It's not quite the same as being able to ask somebody sitting next to you, what did that mean? But it does give you some control over uh, the experience that you wouldn't normally have in a face-to-face -face setting. So that's one point. The second point, um, I think, is that we've, I have experienced larger attendance in online events because people don't have to travel. And so uh, setting aside time zone problems like being awake at three o'clock in the morning uh, for a lecture that's uh, many time zones away, uh, I, I've seen more participation uh, in these online uh, conferences or the online classes. And so there may turn out to be some benefit to using these online techniques, but I'm curious to hear what uh, Efim and Alessio has to say about that. In general, I was very impressed by all this online machinery. You know, life, scientific life, stopped. And then we found out that it did not stop. Seminars go on, and indeed, as Wint said, uh, the participation went up. Still, you know, I have two grandchildren who study online. I teach online. To say the truth, doesn't work very well. Uh, humans are, you know, warm-blooded animals. Uh, we need hmm, a, a personal interaction cannot be replaced. You know, all these years, wonderful lectures are available online. Please, from the best teachers. Still, it does not replace real education and hmm, in person. So I hope that uh, our um, university authorities, funding authorities understand it. So just as a uh, response, I, I, I resonate with what Efim is saying. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a warm-blooded human being too. On the other hand, uh, Georgia Tech uh, in the US has initiated some years ago now, six or seven years ago maybe, an online class uh, for uh, computer engineering or electrical engineering, which costs far less than the in-residence uh, classes do. Uh, and, and it seems to be working in terms of just testing people and seeing what they know. So it may, the experience may not be quite as pleasant, perhaps. 
but I think it's very important for us to recognize that at least some places have managed to produce college level uh, educational courses and successful graduations, even if the experience doesn't have quite the same uh, flavor to it. And I see Alessio has unmuted, so you must have a reaction too. Oh, no, yeah, I, I had the music after everything, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think I second completely everything in any case. I mean, uh, I think it's extremely complicated to to do things online. It's not the same. Uh, there is nothing. Uh, actually, uh, it will actually be interesting also if the audience, uh, even if they don't have questions, if they could kind of comment, if they are, most of them are students they could give us some feedback on their perspective but uh, on my side yeah i feel it's just uh, extremely complicated and uh, and i think as you know online teaching has been around for a while now there are really online universities in several years but still the role of university is not just to give knowledge it's also to uh, you know promote this interaction but also to to give um uh, something you know some kind of uh, uh you know you give project to students they work together and then maybe uh, also the fact as i said asking questions to your to your neighbors and if you cannot do it you go to the assistant and then the professors and uh, also one thing that um, you know one thing that sometimes happens and i think it's extremely useful when you teach in front of an audience sometimes you make a mistake and teach, you know students correct you and that's extremely useful because you, you, as a student, you need to see that the professor make mistakes and you can correct the person and that's fine. And I think it's, but when usually it's done online, especially if it's recorded, there is a tendency of, to, to do perfect lectures because you are very well prepared to, to, to have something recorded. You don't want to record a mistake. And, uh, <laughs> but that's not good, right? Because it is like uh, something immutable and too well prepared. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I think we need a human touch also in <laughs> in the lecture. So um, this is missing. Uh, and I think, as I say, in ETH now we are lucky because we do uh, some in-person teaching as well. Uh, uh, essentially what we do is that we rotate uh, a fraction of the students that they can come into class. So maybe one fifth of the students come and then they rotate. It's better than nothing, right? Uh, but uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's not ideal. So, so uh, let me let me uh, shift again uh, to another observation. Now, some disciplines, like mine, computer science, have the feature that they can be taught easily in a remote way because an awful lot of the interfaces are just what you would see on the screen of a laptop or a desktop. That could be anywhere. And so, uh, the classes that involve learning how to configure something or run uh, a computer program that's doing computational linguistics or computational chemistry or computational physics, those are all quite feasible to do remotely. And so at least for certain kinds of disciplines and certain kinds of applications, the online space works very well. And because it's sort of forced on us by the fact that computers have become so central to a great deal of, uh, of scientific research. But you guys are mathematicians. And so my question for you is whether computational methods have made any difference at all in terms of the kinds of progress that you can make uh, in uh, proving new theorems or discovering new kinds of mathematics? Well, uh, mathematicians work on problems that are very abstract and sometimes detached from reality. How can they keep uh, inspiration? How are they able to concentrate on them for so long. And here, you know, they keep, uh, they find inspiration in each other. Uh, sometimes people need co-authors just to keep, to inspire them, to keep interest. It's much easier and more natural to do it if you meet people personally. Well, I'm nodding my head because uh, most of my favorite work is done with someone else so that we kind of bang ideas against each other. Alessio, I'm sorry, I saw you were going to react. Uh, well, no, no, I was just, uh, isn't, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I second completely F him. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, 
sometimes you think about some, I mean, in my case, sometimes I think about something I'm completely stuck most of the time. And then start, what I start to do is walking maybe in the corridors and just seeing people that uh, are doing something different, maybe students are in the corridors or whatever, just thinking, moving uh, and uh, not being stuck. And now, you know, during the lockdown, you are at home all day. <laughs> you can just walk in the same room <laughs> over and over. I mean, and you don't see anyone. Uh, that's, uh, that's the part, of course, that doesn't work. I mean, we need inspiration and some, sometimes it's just from other people or uh, as I say, just maybe walk and say, oh, today there is this seminar. Let me go and sit. Because also the good thing, if you are, you know, if you, the, it's true that when seminars are online, many people can access it, but usually then you only go to the seminars that you really want to attend. You're not going to sit in front of your screen for a random seminar. Vice versa, maybe, you know, there is, there is the seminar in your topic just going on every week and you just go, whoever is the speaker. And sometimes you go to, to one which was very far from your area and that's one time out of maybe 100, you get a super inspiration out of a talk you will never have attended if it had not been in presence. So, you know, it's difficult to, to realize where there are ideas, uh, but uh, here it's much more regulated. You only talk to people when you have to talk to people. And then, uh, uh, you know, you talk with someone, you already know what to talk about. It's not like, as I said, sitting in front of a blackboard for three hours and just, you know, some moment just talking about something else because you have no clue how to go on. And uh, this part, uh, it's very weird. It's very bizarre, yeah. right? It's very difficult to do online. I see there are questions. Actually, yeah, so I would like to pick up a question which was asked by one of the young uh, researchers, Maria, who in some sense agrees with what uh, Vin said, that uh, there's more attendant conference and she was able to go to conference she would not have been able to attend otherwise. Jitama says, isn't it necessary that we don't go back to normal, but to a new normal, which is more inclusive uh, and let more people participate in, in events by making them online, for example. So how do you, how do you think so about I, that? Yeah, I actually resonate with that point. Uh, it, it's often the case that people who can afford to travel, you know, go to the conferences and people who cannot afford to travel don't. And you end up with sort of a repeating uh, group of people who are funded adequately to participate and a collection of people who can't. And so inclusion uh, is pretty important, even if it's not a perfect uh, arrangement. And so I think I like the, the point of this question is for us to pay more attention to inclusion than perhaps we have in the past. And even if, the, if it's not a perfect solution, it's better to have more people involved. Uh, I absolutely agree. I hope we will go to a new normal uh, with online uh, component. Uh, so people, some people could come to a conference, some people couldn't, but they should be able to participate online. But I don't want only online component. <laughs> Yeah, I also think um, these are very good point. I think we learned some lessons from this. One thing we learned is that, uh, you know, before uh, it seemed that uh, even uh, for some talks, it was worth to, you know, take a plane, run, uh, spend 24 hours trip, uh, give a talk and then run back because we had to teach the day after. And uh, maybe now you're like, yeah, perhaps if it's just to give a talk and not spend a whole week there, it's not that worth it to to just travel, right? Maybe you can do it online. And the moment you do it online, it's true that also you open this to many more people. Also people will not be able to uh, to be there. And I think this is, a, of course, a big advantage, right? So for many people from many countries where there are maybe less events, now they can benefit from this because they will never have attended have the possibility to attend so many talks. So perhaps, yeah, we have to go to a new normal. This I agree. So we need, uh, I think we need events like a nice one week conference. We're all together and we can chat, but probably, you know, for a, if it's just one quick seminar between two lectures in, a, in, a, in our place, we don't need to catch a plane and just be there for two hours, give the talk and run back. So, so just we learned also something. 
Just to reinforce that, I have been in London and now Heidelberg today, uh, and I will be home in time for dinner. And you know, <laughs> that's a big deal. Perhaps I can ask you one other thing. So, I mean, since you, unless you mentioned that it's, I mean, there are not these encounters by chance if you always have to somehow set up meetings and you know what you're talking about. And another, uh, one of the young researchers in some sense also wrote something in the chat which resonates in that, that after class, there's no exchange between students. But we also see, I mean, in the, for example, now the, with the virtual HLF, there's this uh, app where you can somehow walk around in your avatar and meet people. And there are some other, I mean, other kind of apps or technology like that. Did any one of you use that or well, use other I, things to make more chance encounters in the online world? Two things. First of all, there was an old uh, application called Second Life, uh, yes. which, which uh, had an avatar and you could go around visiting people. And there are lots of other ones like that, multiplayer games. At Google, uh, we have in, in our buildings, which are unoccupied right now, we have a place called a micro kitchen. It's a place where there's coffee and other kinds of of uh, you know the, the snacks and things like that, and people encounter each other there, uh, sort of in an unplanned way. Um, we just started to think about an experiment where we would keep online micro kitchens available. Literally, if you went to your office, you would see several different places uh, in the virtual space where you could meet with somebody who is there, and uh, we haven't turned this on yet, we're just exploring the possibility of having uh, these incidental encounters. And Alessio, I think you were about to react as well. So uh, what do you think? Well, I, I don't know if I uh, No, I mean, uh, it's, um, I mean, I said, um, I don't have too much to say on this point. I think we're all, uh, uh yeah there are these things uh, i don't know uh, uh, i'm still <laughs> on the virtual side i have big problems even, even with avatars and everything so um, no it's all difficult i was actually the, a moment looking at the some other comments of uh, students and i said i was just looking at the last one who says it's so difficult to attend a lecture because there are so million distractions on your computer that uh, make complicated right attend and they Actually, when I, I had the same feeling of this student when I was watching some talk in the sense that it's so easy to get distracted also online, you know, it's uh, because you there is an email popping up and, you know, at least if you're in presence, you have, uh, uh, you know, if you're in presence, at least there, you... <laughs> Uh, you cannot just open your computer and start to reply to email or whatever, but then in the, behind the screen, no one can check exactly what you're doing and then you can, you can get easily distracted. So I don't know how it would have been my university if I had to do it, uh, you know, uh, online. Uh, I, I'm lucky that I didn't have this COVID, uh, you know, 18 years ago. Do you think it will change how talks are prepared. So I know that some online seminars, for example, don't take one hour talks anymore, which is the standard thing in mathematics, but do half an hour or half an hour with a break and another half hour. So do you think somehow with online seminars, the way we give talks will change? Um, I, I, I will, I think it's better actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I was, I, I attended two online conferences. Uh, again, it's very difficult to be concentrated for a long time. Actually, I think even the way of teaching should be different. Um, I think one hour lecture is too long. I mean, we should think of uh, lectures maybe split in blocks of 20, 25 minutes, where then you can take a small pause. And you know, you did a, some subject, you say, okay, I proved this theorem, let's take a pause. You can relax a moment and then we start again. But even, you know, by splitting blocks, it helps. And also seminars, I think it will be better because maybe in half an hour, you pass a message, all the talks now, you know, before in mathematics, it was useful to have also an hour because we had the chance to give blackboard talks and there you really can take the time. But if you do online, most likely you will do slides and then you go faster. And then, you know, one hour, a quick talk, maybe it's better two halves where the first half is more, you know, generic 
for many people to attend and then you give another half an hour for those who are really interested in the details of the proof and people can kind of skip in, instead of pretending to be there and then just uh, you know <laughs> muting everything mm -hmm. um, i don't know maybe there are solutions but you know i think one hour concentration in front of a screen it's a lot to ask especially if you do it for more than one time during the day that's my view <laughs> may say a few words you know it's all relative the typical lecture in europe at least it was in the soviet union for union was two hours and when it the united states and uh, 50 minutes it was a cultural shock mm, whether it is too long <laughs> no but, i think it's the online part that i find it long i mean in presence uh, uh, also in italy you know the many professors were skipping the break so in the end it was at least in my end, we also going on for uh, you know they would arrive when they wanted and leave when they wanted so it could be two hours without break that was also common, but uh, you know, if you're there in person, it's really different. But I don't know, two hours in front of a screen, no break. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. that's that's tough. You know, one thing I would point out is that you remember this phenomenon called MOOC. You know, massive on open online courses, and although I think the hyperbolic uh, description of it has has dissipated now, there are people who are still doing online lectures. But they aren't just uh, lectures that go on for an hour or even two. A lot of them are broken into smaller pieces. And then a kind of question uh, is, uh, or a set of questions are asked in order to figure out whether the recipient is actually understanding the content. And I've been told by people who prepare uh, lectures like that, that it's actually hard work, harder work than giving an in-person lecture. And the reason for this is that uh, if, you, if you make use of the response to the test and you discover based on that the student is not understanding something, instead of having them go back and just listen to the same thing you said before, sometimes you want to prepare remedial material based on what you now know the student doesn't understand. And so the preparation actually is harder and longer because you record substantially more information than simply a standing lecture would, would uh, include, but it might actually result in better understanding by the student. So uh, once again, another exploration, not the same, I think, as, uh, as two stu you know, a student and a professor on either end of a log uh, where the professor is asking the student questions and the student is asking the professor questions and the two of them are discovering uh, what it is that the student needs to know. Maybe, Anna, there are many questions, so... Many questions, yeah. I can see and just my chat moving quickly. So yeah, so there one... have been some, so about, uh, I mean, online teaching, online lecturing, and um, I think one which is interesting, which we, I mean, shows a bit a different aspect is um, that some students might actually perform better with online classes and others might like more physical interaction and so if you want to leave no one behind how you strike a balance between the two well uh, alessio uh, both of you look like you're about to react go ahead uh, no i've been thinking about that i think that you know one aspect that i was wondering and i think this will be a social aspect i have a thought that maybe now girls will perform better because in our discipline very often like at the age polytechnic school you have a lot of boys like 90 percent of boys in the class who are always more aggressive and sometimes you know they kind of uh, you know impute, put some pressures and you know then maybe girls have, have a tendency to be a bit more shy and they're less likely to ask questions and they always have to encourage them to ask questions so now, at least, uh, you know, the advantage of online is that it creates a, a, you know, there is no name. Essentially, you can ask questions with a chat often. Mm -hmm. And then this creates a bit more balance. So some, some of my colleagues, what they do to keep interaction, so that's why I think it's not bad to split also the class, is that, you know, you can be teaching online, maybe with your tablet or something, and then you can have the chat open like now. 
and perhaps you know you do 20 you can start to ask questions sometimes in class we do that right we uh we we prove a theorem and maybe we don't say everything and we ask to the to the audience okay now what do you think about this do you think uh this equation is elliptic or whatever you know some math question what and the the reality is that very often either the ones who reply are always the same or no one replies to the question but the online part makes it easier for people to say, say okay let me try anyhow i mean the professor doesn't know who i am i mean it's just a list of <laughs> and then you see these tons of you know 50 60 80 people who reply the answer you cannot check all of them but it's nice right at least if you play it well i think you can make it more interactive still you need both uh, i don't know i think we have to learn um it's difficult for us as well i think it's new for you know it's new for the students it's new for us the professors and then where is the perfect balance between how to include more people and create more equality and more balance inside the classes and at the same time not feel people excluded because some for some people it's very difficult to as i say to work to study from home that's uh, something we still i don't know we're still trying to figure out uh, but I, I think it's right that you know some people of the class will benefit more so maybe we need to to do some in one way some in the other i don't know uh, i think we're still discussing this a lot and uh, but i hope we'll do our best no uh, we will be well we will have to finish soon so i want to make two points first uh, we already have a combination we have we have had it for some time a combination of uh real courses and online courses at the university of california all lectures are recorded and uh, students can watch them as many times as they need second as wind mentioned quite correctly mentioned there are open online courses say mit courses wonderful courses given by wonderful professors so far i never met any mathematician who was educated in this way that's it so um let me let me shift again uh, to uh, a technology question over 45 years ago i'm embarrassed to say i used to be a member of the faculty at stanford it just seems like forever but during the time that i was lecturing i had several television cameras one of them in the back of the room so that you got a face-to-face -face shot and another one was in the ceiling and so you could take a picture of me drawing on a piece of paper that had two benefits. First, it's like being an online, you know, in, in real-time kind of lecture equivalent to writing on a blackboard or a whiteboard, except it was more convenient because I could sit down and I would just draw on a piece of paper. And at the end of the lecture, I had the paper, which I could reproduce and send out as uh, augmentation of notes. The reason I, I bring this up is that we don't have a convenient way of doing the same thing at home or, you know, uh, in, in a remote way. I'm predicting that we should have a device which you could fit to the top of your laptop when it's open that can look down on a place where you can draw and, and write. That would be easier than trying to do a shot of a blackboard, which you're standing in front of, which is, you know, invariably frustrating. Uh, and, and that way we might actually be able to emulate some of the dynamics of an online or rather of a of a face-to-face -face talk and think about working together with someone else uh, you know you're writing the equations down and having a big argument about it and the other guy can show his his or her alternatives so i think we're missing at least one piece of technology that we ought to add to uh the things that we already use for online classes so i, I don't know who to turn to to suggest that but i bet you that that would be a big help so, but the, so the existing technology is not, you're not satisfied with that. So for example, hooking up an iPad to, and share the screen on Zoom or something like that. Well, that might work too. I mean, the slight yeah. uh, kind of thing that you can sketch on, you, you can tell how old fashioned I am. It didn't occur to me uh, to do that, but if it works, uh, yes, no, no disagreement there. If you have a stylus and high enough resolution, that would work too. I mean, that's actually, I mean, for example, for both for me working with collaborators or also for some of the classes we teach here online, we use that because it's the, I mean, it emulates in some sense writing on a board. And, 
So I would like to, so we have five minutes left. I would like to pick up one other question, which goes in a completely different direction from the audience, uh, which deals with the two body problem, which many academics face. And uh, some other question statement is, isn't it with remote working actually alleviate some of the difficulties and um, could one perhaps envision even a fully remote academic job, like a re remote tenure track job where you teach online and you, you are in place X and hired by University B in a, in a different place? How do you th think about that? Um, if I may, um, yes. the problem is that, that I see with that, I mean, this will work if you had a full teaching job, then I could see the uh, something remotely i mean it's a sense if but i don't the point is that i don't believe we will remain remain you know 100 percent remote teaching but let's say even if the teaching remained 100 percent remote still there are things that you need to do in place so of course it can help you know that uh, if i live in a city and i only have to go maybe once a week, I can be more flexible. So of course it could help in terms some flexibility because it means it, it's not so terrible, uh, you know, if uh, you have an academic couple that they don't live in the same city anymore, as long as the commute is doable because it, it, reality now we need to commute less, but, you know, fully remote, uh, I don't think it's doable. I mean, just for the simple reason that we still need to go to the department when there are some, some meetings, still the, you know, you have to have some conversation in person. Uh, right now, we're back to in-person meetings every time we have a large enough room. I mean, that's how we do meetings in our department. And uh, I'm meeting, you know, my students, my postdocs. So, you know, when you have a faculty job, you also have people that work with you, PhD students, postdocs, I mean, you need to meet them. And, you know, uh, I, I cannot just supervise them all the time, just online. So. I think it depends on the position, but I doubt this will help the two body problem. But, but it will help, it will help, as I said, the fact that uh, we need to commute less. So, I mean, we, we probably need to go anyhow a bit less to the department and this could help if you have a bit, uh, not to be commute. When do, when do you have an opinion about that? I mean, you said Google headquarters is yeah, I'm, I've been a long time since I've been on the campus uh, in, in a teaching uh, position. I'm, I'm going to disagree a little bit with Alessio, and the only reason for that is that I've seen enough, historically, uh, enough correspondence courses uh, and, and online MOOCs and other things uh, to believe that it is possible to fill a, a faculty position. There may be some things that you uh, aren't able to do conveniently, but if the primary position uh, has to do with, uh, with lecturing and teaching, um, I think that a uh, remote online uh, position is feasible. Um, so, so I guess I would argue that, that we'll see some of that, uh, but I think in many other cases, you'll want to have a, you know, the ability to see and uh, you know, interact directly with students. But I, I see no reason why at least some uh, positions might be of that kind, especially if they're primarily focused on teaching. Oh, I agree uh, that, that there might appear remote jobs, but very few. So Probably the university offers online courses, somebody has to do it, and that's more or less remote. Also, a research position is practically remote now, because uh, one has to uh, to get some results, publish papers, and uh, where he did it at home or in his office doesn't matter. But uh, if you have a teaching job, would a university hire somebody who intends not to come? Mm, that's a negative. <laughs> yes. Good. So we are at the end of our time. I would like to thank you, the three of you, very much for this very interesting and I think um enjoyable discussion so uh, hope to see you at a different occasion we look forward to that thanks so Bye. much Anna. thank thanks you very much Anna. Anna. thanks to thank you. Thank you. thanks to the other forum for organizing this <laughs>